Carsten, who works for one of the biggest companies in Germany, uh, an energy company called RVE, and he's trying to convert everyone in there to become a blockchain uh, <laughs> fanatic <laughs> with, with an intensity that is uh, admirable. <laughs> so he's going to speak about uh, Internet of Things, I think, um, the Galactico Global Chain Delivery Network, and then Evan, who is visiting from San Francisco. So some of you may remember uh, a year ago, we did the workshop with Evan for his their co project called Codius, which was a Ripple smart contract thing, and, and now that has sort of gone away, but there's something new and even more beautiful that has risen out of the ashes called Interledger. And so he's going to speak about that. So yeah, he works for, he works for Ripple, uh, I'm sure everybody knows. And finally, uh, Ryan. So thanks everyone for Ryan. Because he is uh, on his own accord, nobody forced him. He is recording and live streaming this event once again. So thanks so much. And yeah, you can, you will be able, it will all be on YouTube afterwards. And I don't presume anybody wants to watch it live uh, on Google Hangouts, but if you wanted to, you could. <laughs> so okay, with that, Carsten, please. Yeah, perfect. Thank you for the introduction, Brian. My name is Carsten Stöcker. I'm a physicist. And um, I live in a small town next to Düsseldorf, it's Hilden, and I'm working for RWE. RWE is a huge utility, so we have um, 23 million customers, and um, in our supply chain we have um, energy production, the big nuclear power plants, lignite power, power plants, we do energy trading, we are operating a grid, transmission and um, distribution grid to um, distribute um, power and um, gas and we do retail and if you look in our value chain we basically see that we have huge huge challenges so our power plants are not in the money so um, we basically have to um, shut down our nuclear power plants and in addition um, liquid power plants we don't make money or much money with it as well so we're in deep shit there in addition energy trading that's a core capability of RWE. So we have one of the best global um, commodity and risk trading capabilities in terms of um, power, gas, oil, um, raw materials. Um, and we have a natural monopoly when we distribute power and gas um, to the households. Retail is very competitive. Um, a lot of companies are looking into retail innovation uh, in the energy sector. However, um, yeah, it's competitive, low margin, so it's a challenge. In RWE, we um, started to set up an innovation hub. And this innovation hub is about defining and building the future energy system. It's um, about decentral energy, it's about photovoltaic, it's about batteries. And um, my core belief in RWE is that blockchain will play a dominant part in the future energy system and beyond. And that's the reason why I'm today um, introducing to you the Global Chains Delivery Network. Um, two more comments about innovation. So we started with two people in RWE in summer last year. Now we are 100 plus people in innovation in RWE and we are looking in four lighthouses that are in our center of our business model innovation. That's smart connected home. We are looking into digital um, disruption. We're looking into urban concepts. And the last one, we're looking into big data and blockchain um, in the last light out. Um, blockchain, so we in ROE, and probably most of you as well, have very high expectations in terms of blockchain. And um, one of my preferred quotes is, um, the World Economic Forum is expecting that 10% of the global GDP by 2025 will be um, stored in the blockchain or orchestrated via the blockchain. And if we then look in the numbers, World Bank, so 10% GDP 2025 is um, 10,000 billion US dollar, which is quite a significant number. And um, yeah, that's one of the reasons why we in RWE are one of the first movers to look into blockchain um, and its use cases. I have a second quote 
um, before I go into the concept, and that's Gartner. And um, Gartner is basically saying um, they're expecting a programmable economy enabled by blockchain and smart contracts, smart technologies. Um, and in addition, Gartner is expecting that we see completely new um, forms of value exchange. And um, so I use the term instead of value exchange, delivery network. So there's something being produced and it's delivered to an other business, to a consumer or to a machine. And um, yeah, Gartner is expecting in a programmable economy that's being orchestrated um, via the blockchain. If this is in place, then we have dynamically um, yeah, defined on-demand markets, new economies, attention, reputation economies, and um, one of the key elements will also be um, resource optimization, because resources are limited, and we have to make sure that we have a responsible way forward um, to use resources and assets. So Gartner is expecting a lot of stuff will happen in the program economy, and um, uh, for me, this is about delivery networks, and the definition of a delivery network is that all participants involved in buying and selling a good, energy, transportation services, um, in production, transportation, distribution, installation and service of a good, for a specific geographic market, all these participants are part of a delivery network. And um, yeah, delivery ma networks already exist today. A couple of use cases. I mentioned energies. Then we have supply chain and production. For example, with 3D printing, it can be easily printed apart and um, we can set up a market on a blockchain, peer-to-peer -peer market, to um, provide the access capacities to um, any market participants. Then we have logistics, mobility and communication. I will further explain the concept and I will then um, at the end especially do a deep dive into two use cases and this will be energy peer-to-peer -peer trading and um, e-mobility via the blockchain. Forms of value delivery. Mm, yeah, you can basically say there are three types of value delivery. Be, uh, delivery. Um, you ha can have remote production plants like a manufacturing plant like photovoltaic production, like um, wind um, turbine, um, or like upstream mining. And what is being produced remote needs to be transported um, to a city. In addition, in terms of value exchange, there will be value exchange among cities, um, where people in one city produce something, um, have excess goods, and of course exchanges with other cities. And the last one, um, when we think about um, sharing economy and peer-to-peer -peer transactions, there will be a lot of um, transactions going on in a city. Very generic. And now we um, look into today's problems. A lot of problems in cities are data privacy, pollution, congestion. Um, people have a lot of middlemen involved in supply chains. They're not connected as an individual to wholesale markets to take advantage of um, yeah, efficient delivery, transaction cost, power concentration. And um, our view is by defining four principles, we can address, of address a lot of these um, problems. And um, value delivery, four principles. First one, privacy. And um, when we think about privacy, the ultimate consequence is that uh, we need autonomous um, transaction systems, um, yeah, they do transactions, and if I have them, it's anonymous, then I can ensure privacy. And as a consequence, privacy is even kind of demanding um, technologies such as the blockchain. Um, in addition, the other principle is um, equal participation. So in RWE, we strongly believe in sharing economy in the future, that people share assets, that people provide access to assets, that um, if there's excess capacity, that the excess capacity of assets will be used, and um, that there's some kind of um, yeah, resource optimization in place to get the best out of assets and raw material for the benefit um, of societies and communities. Privacy 
equal participation, optimal resource usage. Um, yeah, if you think this through, we have a peer-to-peer -peer market. We need code to find an optimum solution to transport a good from A to B or to, to store energy in a battery or somewhere else. So algorithms and code is um, required. Last but not least, um, fourth principle is um, a dependable service experience um, because when it comes to physical delivery, we pretty much expect that the service is available, it's reliable, it's safe, it's maintainable, and um, integrity is there. And um, yeah, for that reason, the system needs to take this into consideration. And um, our core belief is, by combination of um, blockchain technology, Internet of Things, and the physical delivery models um, I mentioned, so we can establish um, the global chain's delivery network um, to um, provide peer-to-peer -peer marketplaces, fully automized, fully autonomous, um, um, doing business transactions for the sake and the benefit of a community. And um, so we have a Bitcoin startup meeting here. Um, so who of you are familiar with smart contracts, Ethereum? Okay, so pretty much, um, yeah, we are aware. And um, so we are using the smart contracts to set up decentralized autonomous organization to combine um, a peer-to-peer -peer market with physical delivery. Mm. I introduced the elements um, of value exchange um, from remote sites to a city, among cities, and within a city. And um, our assumption is that in the future we will see a hierarchy of blockchains. So we will see blockchains in cities um, that are doing transactions for physical delivery in cities, in, in one city, and there will not be a dependency among a lot of transactions um, among the other cities. And um, so we can do one use case, energy, e-mobility in a city, and then we need to transport goods, services, and people among the cities, and then we expect that we have a global production and transportation market, which are B2B um, use cases that can be done on a blockchain. And um, the first B2C, B2B use cases, physical delivery, um, are very much kind of specialized. In addition, so you would like to see an overlay blockchain, basically making sure that we can exchange digital tokens, such as identity, cryptocurrency, um, among the markets. Very abstract. Um, that's how we, we see it. Special purpose blockchains, locally for a city, for use cases, millions of transactions in mega cities, for example in China, 10, 20, 30 million there, people there, population, and um, having their special purpose smart contract blockchain doing transactions for mobility, logistics, um, will be a benefit. Cities are then connected among each other, global production transport um, transaction layer, and then the um, overlay. Concrete use cases. Um, so in RWE, we first looked into peer-to-peer -peer energy trading, and that's basically um, prosumers. Pros prosumer is a household, for example, who has um, photovoltaic battery, who's feeding power into the grid and also consuming power out of the grid, who has to offer a flexibility, a flexibility is a huge value for, for energy providers um, to um, reduce consumption or increase consumption on a household level. And then we have the ordinary consumers. And our peer-to-peer -peer energy trading use case is basically bring together consumers and prosumers in one market, doing a matchmaking in terms of bids asks, and then interacting with wholesale players, for example, um, um, power markets and um, grid operators. Um, yeah, how do we do this? So we basically use Ethereum technology, smart contract, decentralized autonomous organization, and um, mm, have our peer-to-peer -peer energy trading market on the blockchain, and basically connecting a peer node to a smart meter to tokenize um, smart meter data, bring this on the blockchain for matchmaking purposes, 
and um, on the next day, again, to read out the smart meter and then to all the billing fully automized um, via cryptocurrencies on the blockchain. So today, so we have um, energy trading and the retail business, and basically with such an autonomous solution, our trading and retail business can be substituted, eliminated um, by decentralized organizations. And that's the reason, it's a disruptive technology. It can be done, it will be done, and that's the reason why we're looking into this um, as well. One of the key elements, of course, end user experience. Um, so we are personalizing energy to provide um, out of the token smart meter readings, how good is the consumption, how is it compared to other peers to provide some gamification um, to this, um, to make more um, use and um, to, to establish more emotions with um, an energy commodity that's probably not mm, so emotional um, today. Um, yes, peer-to-peer -peer energy trading. Um, uh, so we have a fully functioning solution with real trades going on on the Ethereum blockchain. And the challenge we here, has, here have is, of course, um, regulations. So regulations are not quite yet there um, for peer-to-peer -peer energy trading to bring this on the market. And um, yeah, it's not yet a business case because people um, who have photovoltaic, um, they feed the energy into the grid, they get feed-in tariff, and they get more um, compared to this and selling to their, to their consumer peers. And for that reason, it's um, not yet the case. It's working, regulation is changing, and then um, the solution will be relevant. Around the globe, there are at least four or five other teams looking at the exact same use case um, for peer-to-peer -peer energy trading. Electric vehicle charging. Um, that's other use case um, I would like to introduce. Today we have the challenge that um, if you have an electric vehicle, it's expensive and the charging infrastructure is not just deployed. Uh, and for that reason, um, yeah, the electric vehicle um, market share is not quite growing as fast as um, we hope. And um, if we have an electric car, and um, let's say my friend Burkhardt would like to visit me with his electric car, then he's driving to me and charging is quite difficult because there are no charging stations. And for that reason, we thought we should look into private charging. Um, basically, the um, solution today is you drive to a charging pole, you have to take out your cards, you authenticate you as a charging pole. It's complex, it's a bad user experience. And um, then the charging pole is basically trying to validate the authentication via a central database. All the billing is done via a central database. It's expensive, complex legacy systems. And we think we can pretty much improve the user experience by leveraging the um, blockchain and smart contracts. Um, because if then Burkhardt comes to me, um, he can authenticate himself with a crypto wallet. Um, then he gets uh, the um, blockchain triggers a switch. Um, his car will be connected and charged. And at the end, a meter measures the um, amount of energy provided to the car. And then we can do billing um, yeah, of the energy consumed. Basically, again, fully automated, anonymous, um, no man in the middle. And um, this even works for wireless charging. Um, we all expect that the amount of electric vehicles will grow dramatically, uh, dramatically, which means we need to find solutions for faster and more convenient charging. And this will be in the future wireless, with no cable, with no connection. And this can be also full being done fully automized via the blockchain. And one of the use cases is you drive with your car in front of the traffic light. You have to, um, yeah, uh, you cannot move for a couple of seconds. Your car negotiates. Um, um, an energy price, and then the car is charged via wireless charging and with no um, user involved, fully um, automated. And of course, we don't have just cars, we have boats. Um, for example, in Singapore, people have boats, they plug their boats to, um, to the grid to charge them, and even drones in the future um, that run on battery, it needs to be charged as well. And for that reason, we are very confident that electric charging via the blockchain will be relevant. 
Um, we are, of course, doing, not doing this alone. We are doing this on Ethereum. And um, yeah, we are partnering with Slockit to um, deploy such a solution, rapid prototyping, very fast um, to show it's working technically and then to attract um, other large cities um, to deploy such a um, technology um, into the market. Yo. Monetization. Um, so how do we monetize it? Because as RWE, today we are doing retail and trading with margins. And if this is all eliminated by peer-to-peer -peer markets, no man in the middle, decentralized autonomous organizations on the blockchain, there's probably not a role. And um, we think the role will be different because companies such as RWE can orchestrate peer-to-peer -peer markets and there can be a tiny one-time uh, um, uh, one fee or regular transaction fees, tiny as well. We can probably drive value from data if the people allow us to use the data for analytical um, um, use cases. And of course, this is all about global ch scale. So um, the use cases I mentioned, we're pretty much, pretty much uh, aware that German market is not moving fast. Technology penetration is poor. So we almost have no smart meters. We don't have much batteries. We don't have almost no electrical cars. And for that reason, we are looking into markets such as Norway, Oslo, where there's high electric car penetration, Australia, US, um, Chile for peer-to-peer -peer energy trading. Um, so it's global scale. And we're looking at the markets where the right regulatory technology penetration um, yeah, constraints are there that we can really bring technology to the market and um, develop a business. USP, data privacy, user experience, optimization, and um, yeah, it's our core business to have the algorithms to run grids, to run large delivery networks, to optimize them, um, to get the best out of the raw materials and the assets and reputation and trust. Um, physical delivery. So we take it serious at RWE. We're setting up an organization to look into uh, blockchain. We're engaging partners um, to drive use cases forward. We're engaging with the ecosystem because we strongly believe um, in the use cases and the visibility of the business models. And we are also doing a blockchain contest together with GTEC. And um, whoever of you has use cases, physical delivery, blockchain, fintech, um, yeah. You're all invited to participate with your concepts uh, in the contest. Last but not least, um, yeah, it's a call for action um, for all of us um, to engage um, on, on use cases for global chain delivery network, which is a combination of peer-to-peer -peer networks, Internet of Things, and physical delivery. That's the global chain delivery network. Yeah. Thank you. I have a question concerning the. I don't think it's. It does? Okay. Um, can you explain the special purpose? Can you explain. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Uh, can you explain the special purpose uh, blockchain? Like who participates in that blockchain? Who controls the blockchain? Is this. Yes. I didn't understand. One by one. Okay. Yeah, so um, special blo purpose blockchain, a um, couple of assumptions. Assumption is in the future we have many nodes participant participating. If we think about mega cities with millions of households, um, then we need huge scalable um, blockchains. And uh, we think when the transactions among cities don't interact among each other, I could set up a blockchain for one city with all the transaction going on in one city and um, with millions of households. And I don't need to add a lot of other cities to add more complexity, to add more load on the blockchain. And for that reason, we think that special purpose blockchain makes sense. And um, it's also about functional domain. 
um, because when we think about physical delivery, our nodes need to um, fulfill some specifications in terms of what happens if there's a blackout, um, what happens if there's a network degradation, and we are doing physical delivery where safety security is important. And for that reason, um, we believe that we have even to design the infrastructure to fulfill the domain, the use cases. And that's the reason why we call it special purpose. And for scalability purposes, if we have millions of IoT devices, households on the blockchain, we think if we deploy one blockchain for special purpose in one city, that's enough. And we can basically deploy the same technology, more or less the same code in the next city um, to run the, the other blockchain. Yeah, uh, for example, a node can be um, uh, a smart meter, can be a household, can be a router, can be a car, um, can be a locker storage. Um, it's so if we think about the sharing economy, then we need to bring the assets onto the blockchain by either running a light, ultra light node on the asset, on the household, or by connecting the asset to the household via a remote gateway um, to the blockchain. And the assumption is that um, if this technology advances in terms of embedded computing, controlling, and all the work um, Ethereum and others are doing is to establish light clients, this can be run in, any in, in a lot of devices on household level. And then we have millions of devices. Who runs it? Um, the question, um, I don't know, the government, a utility, a peer-to-peer -peer community, um, a private um, consortium, I think that's something for the future to find out. First of all, um, congratulations, and uh, I applaud you for for cannibalizing your own income uh, streams <laughs> to uh, <laughs> to throw to decentralize that stuff. Uh, because I guess you guys are seeing that someone else will do it, so you might as well lead in the in this scene. Um, how do you like? Who's where do you see Bitcoin in this space? Like, do you see that as incentivizing the nodes or um, as liquidity in this network? Or do you see Ether or what, what, you know, what's paying these nodes? What's incentivizing the network to just stay decentralized? And also, if it's not decentralized, um, why not just use a multi-sig normal database that has multiple parties because it's a small group of parties It's much more efficient? Yeah, wh one of the assumptions we had is that we have equal participation and optimal resource usage. And um, of course, when we take this to an extreme, the um, principles, we don't have men in the middle. And for that reason, um, we would like to rely on a public blockchain, fully decentralized. Um, so where is Bitcoin? Um, I think when it comes to smart contracts, to decentralized autonomous organization, to off-chain computing, then we have to rely on blockchains that have a smart contract um, capability, and it's yeah, Ethereum. And um, however, we have the overlay, the global overlay black, uh, um, blockchain, which connects the blockchains. We basically, we can even deploy special purpose blockchains via the overlay network. We need digital tokens such as identity, such as a cryptocurrency, and that's where Bitcoin can be a kind of a glue um, among the um, special purpose blockchains. Hi, very cool talk. It's exciting to see you guys have some prototypes already. I'm just curious, have you done back of the envelope calculations on what you would expect for the network needs? So for example, say a city like Berlin, three million people, I've got, you know, say 10 devices, you know, my smartphone, my fridge, a bunch of this stuff. And then, you know, different number of transactions per second of each device, you know, my phone is pulling and so on. So just, you know, three million times 10 devices times one second per device, we're looking at 30 million transactions per second. So um, any thoughts? <laughs> So basically, we don't eat that um, other e quote. We don't eat the elephant at once. We slice it in pieces. And um, te this technology disruption doesn't come overnight. Um, for example, when we think about electric vehicles charging, and let's assume we have a region with one million cars. Um, probably we charge twice a day a car. Um, OK, if we have wireless charging, traffic light might be more. That's two transactions per car per day. 
um, times one million, it's two million transactions per day. So it's not too bad. Yeah? A special purpose blockchain can handle this. However, when it comes to Internet of Things with all the devices and everything interacting, uh, of then it's um, yeah, pretty almost exponential. And um, no, we have not yet um, thought this through. Yeah. We do this step by step. Um, yeah, thanks again for the talk. But um, have you considered more in detail how you would deal with the inter blockchain communication or verification or how they, they would stack this hierarchy that you propose? So of course we use smart contracts to do this, and I have an expert here, yeah? Fabian. <laughs> Who's the expert? <laughs> now we need interview. Okay, yeah, I'm Fabian from Ethereum. I'm uh, developing the MIST browser, um, <coughs> working at the, for the Ethereum Foundation. So basically what you would do is, the good thing is because you have smart contracts, which is code, and, and this code can do whatever you want, because it's like, a, yeah, it's true and complete code. Basically, a smart contract can verify, for example, the output or another uh, another chain in a way. So you basically would have two smart contracts on both chains, and they would verify each other, and therefore they basically can control in a way the account of the other blockchain. And therefore, you can basically like, have a, a connector between the two blockchains. So right now, if you want to connect the Bitcoin blockchain to Ethereum, the Ethereum side would be safe because you can verify the Bitcoin blockchain, but the Bitcoin blockchain wouldn't be safe. You would need a person for escrow because you cannot lock funds. In smart contracts, you guys can lock funds inside code and it does exactly what the code does. So therefore the funds will not be released until like uh, condition X is, is uh, done. Again, what, did, what, what about time and? Okay. So, I mean, for example, there's, uh, there's a project called BGC Relay from Joseph Chow, and he is uh, basically connecting the Bitcoin blockchain to the Ethereum blockchain. And what he does is that he basically verifies that things happen on the Bitcoin blockchain. For example, you send funds in to an address, and therefore he can release the Ether from the smart contract to whoever, whoever person like, uh, like bought or transferred the Ether. But for the side on the Bitcoin blockchain, you would need kind of like a person which has some kind of incentive not to cheat maybe some ether to lose or whatever. Uh, yeah, so Bitcoin is basically uh, the old train in a way to, he makes it problematic. If we can solve that in the future, I hope so, but there's a lot of consensus required. Further questions, guys? Brian, over to you again. Thank you. Cool. Well, thanks so much. Um, yeah. yeah. If you do, you want to post it in the comments mm -hmm. for the event yeah. or something? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So he'll post it in the in the comment section for the meetup event. Should we just get started? Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, I'll get started. And uh, that was actually a very nice segue into what I'm going to be talking about uh, from the Ethereum folks. So uh, my name is Evan Schwartz. I'm a software engineer at, at Ripple. Um, and I'm going to be talking today about the Interledger protocol, which is uh, very, which is basically trying to answer the question that just, just came up in uh, at the end of the last talk. So 
Let me get this out of the way. Um, OK, so um, payments today are broken. And they would work perfectly if everyone just used Bitcoin for everything. They would also work perfectly if everyone just used PayPal for everything. Some, same story with Visa. Basically, everyone has the same story that the payments would just work amazingly well if everyone just used my ledger. Um, and the, the problem with this is that everyone has a different idea about what the ideal ledger looks like. For you, it might be there's no inflation. For you, it might be the bank has insurance on it. For you, it might be two-factor authentication, what, ha what have you. So everyone has different ideas about what the ideal ledger looks like. And this is true even within um, a relatively small community like Bitcoin. Um, big debates over what the ledger should look like. Um, and it makes sense that there's these kinds of debates because the design of a ledger has a lot of a lot of values and a lot of ideas built in. You know, how, how many transactions should it be able to process? process? Does that matter at all? Does it not? Things like that. Um, all of these are the kinds of debates that get built into the, the structure of, of a ledger. And my argument would be that the world is never going to agree, period. Sorry. Um, so then if we ask the question, like, why are payments broken? The reason is that payment networks are disconnected. Uh, the ideal would be rather to have a network of payment networks. And so what this would look like is you can decide on whatever ledger you want to use, whether it's a bank, whether it's Bitcoin, whether it's Ethereum, um, and there would be good ways to move value between them securely, cheaply, et cetera, so that anybody could pay anybody else. And what that would look like would be Let's say I only want to hold dollars, and now I'm, in, now I'm in Europe. So half the people want euros, some people want gold, uh, some people want Bitcoin. Like, everybody wants something different, but to me that shouldn't matter. I just want to walk around with whatever I have, and I should just be able to pay everyone seamlessly without really having to think about it. Now, um, this, this looks lo a lot like how the internet works, where you have a lot of different networks that are connected using different standards. So in order to make this work, basically we need standards for relaying and routing money securely across different ledgers. And that's what interledger is. Um, so how does it work? Um, so first we start kind of with the basic building block. What is a ledger? A ledger is just any system that tracks accounts and balances. So that could be a decentralized ledger like Bitcoin. That could be a centralized ledger like a bank. Uh, that could be one of these special purpose blockchains, etc. Anything that has accounts and associated balances. Problem, as I said before, not everyone is on one ledger. So we introduce this, this role called a connector. Um, connectors relay money. So they have, there's some entity that has accounts on both, on both ledgers and can accept money into one account and pay out on the other side. So the natural question is, what happens if the connector drops it? If it's just a person standing in the middle offering like, hey, yeah, you send me bitcoins over here, I'll totally send you money on Ethereum. Um, not so trustworthy. Um, so if, some, if the connector drops it, money would be lost. And that's kind of how uh, in, in correspondent banking today, when you send a wire transfer, this is basically how this works, where there's a sort of blind handoff between all of the parties, and if, you, if your wire transfer gets lost, and a good percentage of them do, uh, you go to your bank and you say, what happened to my money? And they're like, actually, we don't know. Um, because the money, just they passed it on to the next, the next bank, and something went wrong, probably not because of malice, but they're doing a lot of transactions, it's a lot of manual stuff, et cetera. Something went wrong, now money's lost. So how do we fix this? Um, so we use cryptographic escrow to provide security. Um, and so rather than relying on some external party to provide this escrow, we want the ledgers themselves to provide this escrow with the idea that um, you shouldn't have to trust anybody addition, in addition to your ledger to provide this escrow. So if that's a bank, that should mean the bank provides this as a service for you. If that's Bitcoin or Ethereum, they have that functionality built in um, as, as you guys were discussing before. Um, so Bitcoin already provides escrow via scripts, Ethereum as well. Other ledgers can add it. <coughs> And where's the number? Um, oops. So 
if we start, so I want to we'll just walk you through the protocol. So in the f there's two stages of this protocol. First is the preparation or escrow phase. Um, so in the first phase, uh, basically everyone escrows money pending some common cryptographic condition with the idea that the condition should be the same across all of them. So the sender puts money in es escrow. So the sender is Alice over here. Alice says, I'm going you know, to lock up money pending some condition. Um, the connector, Chloe in this case, sees that and is like, okay, you locked up money on a, on a ledger that we trust in common. Um, you could think of this as Bitcoin on the left, Ethereum on the right, or, or any other combination of ledgers. Um, and the idea is that Chloe doesn't trust Alice to have just be holding on to the money, um, but she trusts the escrow service, which is the ledger itself, um, to reliably hold on to this money. Does that make sense? hope so. Um, so Funds are put in escrow pending some fulfill, the fulfillment of some condition. And what, it, what is that condition? Oops. Uh, can I just ask you what escrow means? Sorry. Um, yeah, so, so escrow is like um, if you buy a house often, um, this, this happens in a lot of countries, if you buy a house, you want, like, I have the money and I'm buying a house from you. I have the money. You have the title of the, the, ha the deed to the house, um, the, like, property title, whatever. Um, and so... You don't want to give me the title until I give you the money, but I don't want to give you the money until you give me the title. So we're sort of stuck, and so what you often do is you'd have some trusted third party that would kind of take both of these and only switch them once, um, once, the, once the condition of like both people having it was, was fulfilled. Um, so in this case, what that would look like is you lock up some money, so you say you're committing like, I will transfer this money to you only if some cryptographic condition is met. Does that make sense? I'll fill out the form after. All right, great. Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, so this, in the second phase, the execution phase, uh, transfers are completed in reversed order so that the connector is incentivized to actually complete it correctly, and I'll show why. Um, so at first, the, so the, the condition that everyone is basically waiting for is the receipt from the recipient saying, yes, I got the money. Um, cryptographic proof that it has actually been delivered. Because if you're the sender, that's all you really care about. Money could go through any kind of crazy path, but ultimately what you want is some proof that it got where it was supposed to go. So the recipient signs the receipt. Um, the receipt fulfills the condition on the ledger on the right, so the money is actually transferred. So the money is released from escrow, recipient gets paid. And this is quite different than how normal payments work because it's this backwards execution flow. Um, and the reason is that now, at this point, the connector, who's the person that you'd be questioning, like, do they really have an incentive to actually complete this correctly, they're actually out the money. So they've paid out money and without getting paid back. However, they have this money in escrow waiting for them pending this condition. So what they do is they take the receipt from the ledger and they simply pass it on. Um, and that, that receipt unlocks the money on the other side, so they get paid. And the reason why they were okay doing that is because uh, as long as the conditions are the same on both sides, they know that the thing that takes money out of the, their account will be the same that puts money in on a different system. Um, at this point, the payment is complete. Um, so quickly gonna run through what this, what this gives us and then show an actual demo. Um, So if you, if you um, there's a good question. So the question is, uh, what's the advantage of backwards instead of forwards? So if you did it forwards, the, um, you'd, the sender would send money to the connector, and you'd be relying on the connector to pass the message on, but they would have no incentive to do that because as far as they're concerned, they've just gotten paid, and now like they, ha they have no reason to, to pass it on. And so by doing it in reverse order, you give the, the connector a very strong incentive to actually pass the message back. What's that? No, definitely not. Because if you're the, let's say, so let's say the connector on the left is, just for simplicity's sake, I'll use uh, dollars and euros. So let's say the ledger on the left is euros and the one on the right is dollars. So what, what's happened at this point is that the connector has paid someone a uh, hundred euros but has gotten nothing in return. And so 
if you're, if you're a connector and you're operating in that business, I would love to work with you because you're just going to be paying out money without getting anything from me. So what you really want as the connector is you've paid out money on this side, and now you have a very strong interest to go and collect your money that you're owed over here. Otherwise, you just lose money. So it's very different than if you just went the other way. Um, but let, you still have questions about it at the end. Let's, let's bring it up in Q&A. Um, so what, is, what does all of this give us? What's the, what's the point of this? So um, one of the, the biggest benefits of this is chained payments. And the idea is that, as I was saying before, like you should be able to send money through any number of hops. So I was showing a very simple case with just one connector in the middle, but the same principle can be applied across an arbitrary chain of ledgers and connectors, and it can be as, as far apart as you want, with the idea that I could be on my tiny little community currency ledger somewhere in some random state in the United States, and I still should be able to pay any one of you in this room, and you should just receive that money, not as the little community currency, cur uh, community currency that I want, um, but as whatever you want it as. Um, and so it will show up, the idea is that it will show up in your account just as bitcoins or what, what have you on the Bitcoin ledger, and it will leave my account as whatever I want, and we don't really have to think about what happens in the middle because we know that money can't get lost in the middle. Um, so it's risk-free for the sender and the recipient. So um, there's two modes of the, this protocol. One of them I didn't, didn't describe, but you can read about it in, in the white paper. But in, in this mode, basically, the connector is the one that's assuming this risk. Um, if, if there's a problem with one of the ledgers, the connector can lose money, but they can also price in that, that cost. If, the, if a ledger is very unreliable, it'll have higher fees. I can explain that more if people are curious. Um, Another thing is that this system is uh, limitlessly scalable because there's no single system that needs to process all of the transactions in the world. Um, if you want to process more transactions, you can just add more ledgers and connectors, and the system will automatically find a path from one to the other. Um, in that vein, it'll automatically select the cheapest path. So if there's some ledger or some connectors that are charging really crazy fees, you can just go around them. And that's the idea. And if this system is very open and well connected, there should be a very competitive market to go between any two ledgers. And with something, and an advantage of an open system like Bitcoin or Ethereum um, is that it's very easy to, cr to create a connector into or out of it. Um, so that should be an especially competitive market, which is good for everyone trying to send money in or out. Um, another piece is that this is private to all the parties involved, so because there's no public system, there's no single place where all of these transactions are recorded, so the only people that ever need to know about these transactions happening are the ones that are involved. That's, of course, it remains to be seen how some of the regulatory stuff shakes out, um, but at least from the, the technical perspective, from the, the protocol, all that's necessary is that um, the individual ledgers know about it. Um, and so if one of those is, is a, a public ledger, what you would see on there, if like that middle ledger were Bitcoin, for example, um, you would see a transaction from the, con the connector in blue on the left to the one on the right, um, but you wouldn't necessarily know what that was a part of or what the bigger transaction that it was part of was. Um, and another thing is that this can be used to connect very disparate systems. And so the, the whole goal of this kind of standards effort um, is to create the minimum standard that would link all of these different systems securely so that you could actually have this work across very different systems ranging from Bitcoin to Ethereum to age-old banking ledger, bank ledgers um, with the idea that this should be like the, the standard that's at the, what's actually necessary to make this possible um, is very, very minimal. That's the idea. And so that's interledger. Um, there's still plenty of work to be done, ranging from uh, implementing Bitcoin and other ledger integrations, standardizing some of the, actually working on standardizing some of these conditions and APIs, um, and developing further use cases. And interledger.org is the website. Um, you can read the white paper, which we put out in October. It's kind of a, a quite technical uh, articulation of what I just described, as well as the, the other mode of this protocol. Um, you can try out the reference code, it's available on GitHub, and join, uh, we're working on this as part of a World Wide Web Consortium uh, community group, so you can join that. Um, and I will switch over to, um, so, a little um, view of what this, so this is a sort of test interledger network all running on my laptop, so 
what each of these circles represents is a different ledger. So any one of these could be a bank or a national, a national payment network or a Bitcoin or whatever. Um, and so what I'm going to do, what I'm going to show is just that this can very quickly and securely send money across different systems. So um, I'm just going to select two random ones. Um, and what it's going to do is it's going to go through um, first finding a path. And then um, if you, it's maybe hard to see, but and showing the different steps that it's going, the different phases. So when it shows up in gray at the beginning, that's the proposed step. Um, when it turns orange, that's when money is actually escrowed. Um, and then when it turns green, that's when money has been transferred. And so um, show a couple more examples of that, maybe blow it up a little bit more. Um, and so that's actually with it slowed down because it's not su it's kind of difficult to visualize if it moves really quickly, but um, this is the, the speed, obviously this is especially fast because there's no network latency, it's just running on my laptop, but um, the, it would be really great if we could reduce um, transaction times to just network latency, uh, as opposed to what it is right now. If you try to send money across different systems, you're talking about days and lots of risk. So um, this is what's available on GitHub. You can go and check it out and play with it and get involved. Now, questions? Okay, I just have uh, actually two points. Like um, one question: What would be a case where it actually fails? So where because you have this like, this connector, and this connector takes the risk, right? Yeah. Like what would be an example case where actually the connector loses the money? Great question. So. Um, the question is, why would a connector lose money? So in this mode of the, of the protocol, the reason why a connector would lose money is because um, you don't want, when you put money in escrow, you don't want to put money in escrow indefinitely. If someone down the line just is offline, you want that there to be some kind of timeout. And what that means is that if the different transfers are going to have staggered timeouts, um, that means that the connector has kind of some window of time in which they have to get a message from one ledger to another. But if the ledger is down, for example, then they could be out the money. So if, if in the middle of, um, go, oh, lovely, been signed out. Um, that's not helpful. Well, I want to show it now then. Um, so uh, if, the, if in the middle of when the connector is passing money back, um, one of the led there's a problem with the ledger, um, then the connector stands to lose money. However, that's a, very, that's a kind of a knowable risk. Like with, if, you're, if you're going to, into business as a connector, you would want to assess what's the risk that this ledger is down. Is it a highly available system? Like what, what chance is there that in this time frame it's going to be down and then you would price that risk in. And so if the, re the ledger is super, super reliable, that price, the cost would be negligible. Um, if it's a very unreliable ledger, it would be higher. Does that make sense? So one follow up here. Um, so if, if like the connector controls the private keys, I guess, right? So, so it creates two accounts on both chains, on each one, one account. So basically, what stops the connector to just run away with the money? Because once it's get the money, it has it, right? Yeah. Um, so, uh, like, what stops the connector from running away from the money? So I think you might have you might have might have stepped out for um, the moment when when I was describing this. But um, basically, the connector has these two accounts, and they don't actually get the money. Um, until they've delivered the money. So the, connect, the connector's incentivized to pass it on because they deliver the funds first and then are paid back. Um, and so that, so that was what I was describing before where they have a very strong incentive um, where the money is first escrowed by both of the ledgers. So it's the ledger holding onto the money, not the connector. And then um, the recipient signs the receipt, it unlocks one of them and they pass it backwards. Um, we can talk, talk more about that, that afterwards. You got more questions. Um, next question. So I get how this works when you have, let's say, Bitcoin and Ethereum, or, or two ledgers where you can you know, escrow money and you have smart contracts and all that stuff. But how would that work if you have something like a bank? Because, I mean, I even if you have the receipt, for example, that you've given out the money, as you know, connect let's say on the Bitcoin network. You know, how can I use that to claim something from a connector from a bank? Yeah. So, how does this work with banks? Um, uh, banks are banks are very interested in adop in adopting this. Basically, Ripple's been working with banks for um, two years now, and uh, part of where this 
where this, the idea for this came out of was banks were very interested in Ripple's technology, but said, um, you know, if we're interested in this, we want to see how this scales. Like, can we push millions of transactions uh, through this per second? Um, and then they were also concerned about privacy on a public ledger. Um, and so, uh, as soon as we came out, so they had come to us with those concerns as we were as we were going to them and they were like, yeah, we're very interested in adopting your technology, but we have these two concerns. And then we came out with Interledger and they were like, yes, concerns solved. Um, and so uh, now the now Ripple is basically uh, hard at work, um, while I'm here talking to you, um, uh, in implementing this in, in our product suite that we deploy at banks with the idea that, um, not with the idea, with the, the intention that, um, Banks, banks will have this capability built in so that they will, they'll be able to recognize these kind of crypto, cryptographic conditions um, and trigger the, the movement of funds. Um, it's an open, op there's an open question about uh, who that functionality will be open to. Um, we're obviously interested in pushing, it, pushing for it being as, as open as possible. Um, there will definitely be some pushback, so that's something where uh, if you guys are interested in this kind of thing, I would encourage you to get involved in the community group effort because that's the, that's the kind of discussions that we're going to be having is like, who can be, who can be a connector, uh, legally, business-wise, et cetera. So that that come, yeah. So that so the question about like um, how can you, what makes it so that you could trust something like a, a bank, whereas like with Bitcoin uh, it's secured by the blockchain. With a bank, it's just the reputation. Um, so a lot of that comes down to uh, who you're willing to trust. So different people trust different ledgers for different reasons. And so some people think mining is like that's the way to have a secure ledger. Other people are like, no, that's garbage. Like you, the only way to have a secure ledger is like backed up by the military of the U.S., etc. Um, like different perspectives. Those people are never going to agree. But as a as a connector, you'd basically be the connector would be some party who sits in between both that is willing to, for whatever combination of reasons, trust both of those systems. Um, and so that could mean they, you know, and they they only trust it to some extent. They um, like it the the amount of trust they place in it is dependent on how much money they actually have holding uh, sitting at it. And so I guarantee you that there will be plenty of people that would be willing to trade between JP Morgan and uh, dollars or whatever and Bitcoin. That that will not be a problem. Um, whether you trust that or not, that's that's a different story. And so that's the idea like you would not have to have the goal would be to make it so if you don't want to trust JP Morgan, you don't have to have an account with them and you don't have to operate a connector to them. And so in, in that case, you're not trusting them at all. If, if I have to happen to have an account at JP Morgan and you want to send money to me, um, you're like, I will produce some cryptographic receipt saying like, yes, I got the money. And so obviously that's sort of pending whatever the terms and conditions are of my ledger, but that's what I've signed up to by depositing funds with them in the first place. Just so the exchange rates are determined by the connectors, right? Yeah. And how dynamic is this? Because can I first ask for what I will get out and then execute it 10 minutes later? So I mean, yeah, yeah. the exchange rates are very dynamic. Yeah, um, so the exchange rates can, can be very dynamic or not. Um, different, the, I, my personal vision of this would be that different connectors will operate differently. Some will set a per day exchange rate, some will set, have an order book, um, and we'll, you'll just take the top of the order book with the, you know, the best price for however much money is there. Yeah, so um, that also is, a, is sort of dependent on the connectors. That's part of the, the st effort of standardizing the connector APIs. Um, so right now, what this, pro what this is actually doing is it's first asking each connector for a quote. Um, it's going out and crawling this little web, asking each connector for a quote, determining the cheapest path, and then taking that. Um, and so the one way to solve that would be like if a connector says one thing and then you actually go to take it and it can't deliver, that would the transaction would fail. And then next time you'd remember that and you'd be like, okay, well this, you know, this connector says it's gonna give me a really good rate and then never delivers, like 
don't bother with that one. Um, and that's pretty easy information to collect, and so that could be collected in a distributed manner, in a centralized manner, in both, whatever you, whatever you like. That, that kind of topic, though, is a really big point of discussion in the community group of, like, um, what exactly is the, what are the APIs for interacting with these? Um, what are the like terms and conditions? How do you identify bad ent entities? Um, how do you distribute that information? Things like that. Yeah. Um, looks amazing. Um, wh what what happens if um, let's say you know Ripple is based in the U.S. And let's just say, imagine if US goes rogue somehow, the state goes out of control and enforce, forces you to then expose everything. Is that a possibility? How is it governed? How is the network code changed? You said before it was anonymous, but it didn't have to be. Yeah. yeah. Good question. So um, there, this is not a network in the same way that something like Bitcoin is a network um, because there isn't um, like, this is, these are protocols, uh, more like HTTP is a protocol, where it's a, it's a language for different parties to speak to one another. And so these parties could be geographically dispersed, they could be sitting in different jurisdictions, et cetera, um, and not have anything to do with one another. And so there's no network that we are operating. Um, we're not in the flow of these transactions at all, and so there's no information that we could give away. Um, if you're talking about like what information are each of the parties involved forced to collect, that's a different story. That that would come down to um, how the regulations shake out. Um, I think there's actually a very strong argument for at least with with some with some limits, like um, for these kinds of transactions to be private, because um, if if there's any argument for keep for any kind of user privacy in general, um, payments are a very important like especially if you're making smaller payments and if the payment like right now we we don't make on average I think many people make uh, I've heard something like 2.1 payments per day. That's not that revealing of what you're doing. If your phone or whatever is like constantly paying for things, a la global distributed uh, global delivery network and like your car is paying for if everything is paying for stuff, this becomes much more revealing of your behavior and so I think there's very strong arguments for why that kind of stuff should be private um, and but it, some of that remains to be seen so in in summary like there's no network that is collecting all of this information um, that lives with the different parties they may be forced or not to ask for more information in order to facilitate a transfer for you, but that will also depend on the jurisdiction, on the ledger. For example, like JP Morgan's ledger might have very strict requirements on what you have to tell them about why you're making this payment, um, whereas Bitcoin doesn't care, because uh, there is no one to care. Um, so it, it depends on the ledger, depends on the, on the jurisdiction. Um, but the, the, the architecture of this is very similar to the internet, where the internet is made up of different telecom companies in different countries um, that have peering arrangements with one another. And so the, the goal is to make this internet of value work the same way, where you have dis disconnected or like different and independently controlled networks that have different people in different countries, different rules, etc. Um, and they can all establish relationships to connect to one another. So um, I think you partly answered it in one of my questions before, but maybe I'll, I'll ask it in a different way and then sort of follow up. Um, so I, I, the part my question had been, you know, how does how is the path determined from you know um, point A to point B in between? And I guess you hinted at that it's sort of from the sender it does a minimization of cost um, based on sort of crawling the whole network. But that isn't necessarily a scalable thing, depending how many payment networks there are. So, you know, if I'm sending packets from um, my server to a server in random India, it's not going to crawl the entire web just to send that packet. It sort of does this sort of flipboard thing, right, along the way, TCP. So maybe if, if I, yeah, I have a second question, but maybe I'll, let's do this first. Ask the, ask the second question. Okay. Sorry, yeah, so the second question is um, with the different actors in the ecosystem, uh, Ripple, um, the banks, um, the W3C group, what are the different incentives, uh, especially monetization for the banks, but also like why bother with the W3C group? Okay, so um, the first question is uh, everybody's favorite question um, when, it, when it 
when this first comes up is like, how's the path determined? Um, one of the things that, that I think is quite nice about this protocol is that uh, that the, the pathfinding piece is neatly separated from the actual movement of money. And the reason, one reason for that is that um, the, the pathfinding algorithm that you use depends very much on what the topology of the network is. And so if this, you know, fast forward 10 years, if there's like 100,000 ledgers and there's like pairwise connections between a lot of them, that would call for a very different algorithm than if there's like, you know, 100 banks and there's only, and like, a handful of cryptocurrencies and there's basically one connection between each of those, that would be a much simpler kind of algorithm. And so that's, we're, we're actively discussing that question, but don't have, uh, we don't have a, an algorithm proposed in the paper just because um, what you need first is this underlying way of like, right now, it's not even worth talking about the pathfinding because there's no way to securely move money across the, all of these different systems. What we're introducing is this kind of bottom layer, and that's why I said there's a lot of, a lot of work to be done. So that feeds into the other question, why the community group? So um, Ripple's putting, the, putting this out there. Ripple's, uh, the original vision was to create, the, the company's mission statement is to create the internet of value. And this is, this is kind of what, what, what we've been thinking, and the, the um, original, way of going about that was having a ledger that everyone could issue assets on and then trade really easily between them. Um, we ran into the same problems that everybody runs into, which is when you go around and you say like, we have this great ledger that you should connect to and then we'll make payments really easily, everyone is like, why don't you connect to my, like, you, you get into this same discussion all over the place. like. Why not? Why you know connect to my ledger? Or people have criticisms about how it's built, it's the trust model, things like that. And so this is like a different way of achieving the same vision. That's more open, more neutral. Um, there's no currency built in. There's no network. There's no like validators built in. Um, things like that. So that's one of the reasons to go for the community group is to bro to build like a wide base of support for this, as well as also like there's a there's frankly a lot of work to do on actually achieving this vision. And so um, it's not very powerful if just one company is working on it. It's much more powerful if a lot of people are like, yeah, I really like that vision. I want to pitch in and like give my two cents and how this should work. Um, so that's why the the W3C group. Then on the on the monetization thing. Um, Always an interesting question. So um, W3C is obviously not concerned about monetization. They do web standards. They do standards for the browsers, et cetera. Um, the reason why we picked the W3C in particular as opposed to other standards bodies um, is basically because of their process. The W3C has a very nice kind of open process, and they're committed to open standards, whereas not all standards bodies, somewhat ironically to me, uh, are committed to open standards. Um, and so uh, that's the reason for that. Um, why the banks are interested in this. Um, something amazing that I didn't really know before starting working at Ripple is that you think that that banks are like making tons of money off of the fees that off of like the transfer fees that they charge, and it turns out that like mo, mo, like 99% of all the banks in the world, if they make money, they make like a really tiny amount because the the they have to pay fees onto the net. All of the correspondence that they use, um, they pay fees to. And so the, the banks that benefit from the current system are, are, are a much smaller set. And a lot of them are very interested in this idea of like being able to connect directly to other banks, as well as there's this benefit of, I was describing, this ridiculous situation where banks send money to another bank and then they have no idea whether it's gone through. Um, and so they see this and they're like, wow. You mean you, there, what do you mean there's no way for money to get lost? Like, what, what about over, like, we're used to having all this, like, cost involved with the, you know, we reckon, to, total up the books at the end of the day and they never match. And then we have, like, an army of people whose job it is is to call one another up and say, like, hey, line, like, 46, like, what happened there? Um, so that's their incentive to use this. Um, I think in the beginning they will probably be, um, they will definitely want to be charging transaction fees. I think as time goes on, uh, per transaction cost should go down because the marginal cost of sending these payments should be so low. Um, so we'll see how we'll see how that plays out. Um, and then for Ripple, I mean, we're we're working with banks and we're working on getting this integrated. And so we're very interested in more people like working on this, integrating it. Um, 
working with others to integrate it, and w right now we're getting uh, like basically service and support fees from and integration fees from the banks that we're partnering with, which is a good good number. Most of the partnerships are unannounced, but um, there's a lot of the, the like top global banks uh, interested in working with this. Um, let's go to the. Hi, thank you for the talk. Um, when you mentioned earlier the, the the different algorithms that are possible for the for finding a path, how much uh, decentralization is there in that part? Um, so, how much decentralization is there in the pathfinding? Um, again, like totally depends on on how it how it shakes out. Um, I think my ideal would be that there's a variety of different strategies um, and that you could use any because like if if the network is sufficiently open and if all of these ledgers and connectors would allow you to get the rate get their rates um, then you'd be able to like and and observe things you'd be able to collect that information in a distributed way you'd be able to collect that information in a centralized way and people could basically opt to use whichever one they want um, and so that's one of the open questions. Um, if you're very, if you're interested in discussing that, I would say please join the community group because it's a it's a big topic, and there's some people who have put uh, a lot of thought into that topic in particular. And so I think I think it'll evolve. Like that that very much depends on the topology of the network of how you know if it's a if it's a very small network, it's a trivial task. If it's a very big network, it gets a lot more complicated, and then it, that would call for different strategies. So um, it remains to be seen. Join the group to see see it play out and influence it. Um, maybe take one more, one or two more questions, and then kind of call it. Or okay, or I'll take like two more, two or three more questions, and then we'll, we'll call it. If anybody want to wants to stick around and, and talk about this, feel free to. So, has anyone already done a color coin uh, implementation integration? No. Um, so we, we released the white paper in October um, and the code shortly behind it. We've been working on it for a year, but we've been working on it with um, like the, the ledgers that are running on my, on my laptop are very, very simple with the idea that we're not trying to do anything fancy with the, the reference implementation. This is just about like showing this proof of concept with, with different, si different systems. But they're very simple, hooked up to a simple like SQLite database. Um, uh, or actually any SQL database, and um, implementing the, the APIs. But um, if you're interested in working on color coins, uh, if you're interested in doing this for Ethereum, like we would love to see those implementations written. We, this is another reason to, we're trying to expand this effort and kind of um, get, show people what, what this vision is about uh, because we cannot build all of this ourselves. So uh, the company as a whole is 130 people. There's three and a half people working full time on the, Somewhere between two and a half and three and a half, depending on how you count it, working full time on the um, um, on this reference implementation right now. Um, and there's more people working on getting it built into the systems that will be deployed at banks. But we have, you know, only only so much time and resources to put into it. So um, would love to, if other people are interested in building implementations of connectors and such for others, would love to see that. So I, I really think like this is a great effort that you're doing because this is like connecting kind of legacy systems to the new cryptocurrency world and also like the uh, cryptocurrencies without smart coins and with, it, with each other is a very noble and very important uh, piece of the puzzle necessary to actually get funds into the cryptocurrency world and out. Yeah. Um, as I understand it's like you're creating a protocol like trying to get a standard, mm -hmm. creating a standard. I'm not 100% sure how secure the role of the connector is. It feels for me like it's he is cheatable. But anyway, I can ask you this later. Um, did you ever thought about like um, like methodologies and standards between two ledgers which have smart contracts? Because once you have smart contracts and basically code controlling money, then suddenly you can make this, uh, you don't need a connector anymore actually. You can have it very secure, interchangeable. Or you can have a very secure connector where actually nothing can, can, can get lost. Did you ever like explore these or looked into these? Yeah. So um, one one way of looking at at 
uh, the, these crypto, cryptographic conditions is that they are smart contracts. They're, they're boiled down, so they're not, um, they don't have the full scripting power of Ethereum, but the idea is to define a much more minimal set of that you could actually standardize. Like, uh, the idea of every ledger in the world implementing a Turing complete scripting language, not gonna happen. It's, it's too complex, there's too, mu there's too much implementation cost, uh, there's too many kind of potential vulnerabilities. Um, so the idea is to define like a smaller subset of a very simple example would be just um, a simple like checking a, sign a digital a cryptographic signature algorithm. So that would be one way of, of doing it across these different systems. And so you would actually be having a kind of smart contract holding onto the money on all these different systems. And so the, uh, the way that you prevent the connector from getting screwed is the connector doesn't trust the, s the sender. They only trust the ledger guaranteeing that the funds will be there pending the, the same cryptographic condition. Um, so that is kind of what this already is doing. Um, is using a very ba very minimal kind of smart contract ability on all the different ledgers. Um, no, so the 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 connector is the one providing the funds and responsible in the universal mode for the relaying the message. Um, but the reason why they relay it backwards is because we want them to have a very strong incentive to actually relay it. Um, but they're not execute, they're not moving the funds. The ledger is the one responsible for moving the funds. So the, so the ledger holds onto it, and then once the cryptographic condition comes in, if it's good, then before the timeout, then it goes. Um, so, um, Mm -hmm. So I know he will send me first the money. So first it means the, uh, the connector needs to have the money first. No, it's, it's uh, escrowed first. So it's not actually sent to the connector. Yeah, so, okay. So our, how I understood is the connector sends first to one chain and then receives the money from the other, right? So it's everything is put in escrow first and then it's executed. Um, and so the, the connector is relying on the security of the ledger providing that escrow to to guarantee it. No, because it, no, 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 because you would use the, I believe it's the check, the check lock time verify, or some, the, you'd use the, like, um, um, script, the hash pre-image signatures um, with a timeout uh, on Bitcoin. And you'd, you'd express the same kind of idea on all the different ledgers. Yeah, okay, last question. So much dis disruption going on in this place at the moment. That's amazing. Um, so um, how quick is this? Uh, you said network latency, I guess. But um, you know, we run a Bitcoin Gold Exchange. And um, you know, part of the regulatory issues that I think we're going to come across is the, that we have to hold people's funds to make high frequency trading and everything happen. Um, it seems like this might be a, a good way of holding funds in a decentralized escrow. Um, uh, users uh, still being able to interact uh, is is would it be fast enough for you know what we're seeing now in some of the best uh, centralized markets doing high tr frequency trading could could that yeah so the speed of the system is is just based on um, how fast each of the ledgers can process a transfer um, and then the network latency between all these participants so um, take those separately so uh, Different ledgers will have different processing speeds. Some will be, you know, they'll only deliver your funds in a day, and some will be 10 minutes, and some will be nanoseconds. Um, on the connectors side, the connectors are the ones responsible for relaying money. They have the very strong interest in having really good, fast, reliable connections to the ledgers that they're connected to. So that should be a kind of negligible amount. Um, and especially if it's a very competitive market, then that kind of thing will start start to matter a lot, and you'll see connectors sort of competing on that potentially. Um, so the the latency of this should be basically the same as like when you're loading a web page from a different country. Like it shouldn't it should be able to happen at, at that kind of speed. Um, different systems will support or not support either for technical reasons or ideological or business ones, so high frequency trading type, type activity. Um, that just depends on the design of the individual system. This doesn't really dictate that, but uh, these transactions should be able to happen as fast as the participants can allow them to, to happen. Is, is the connector waiting for confirmation or anything? I mean, 
so the, well, yeah, so in, in the case of something like Bitcoin, the, it would be up to the connector how, much, how long they're going to wait um, for this. And so what that'll have an effect on is if for something like Bitcoin you need to ask for a longer timeout, that might affect the fees, for example, because a connector or all the participants need to put money on hold for longer. Um, so it'll show up in different ways. But um, that's kind of the what, what, we're, what we're working on figuring out in the community group. So um, last plug for joining the community group, check out interledger.org, white paper's up there. Um, you can also get in, get in contact with us. Our contact info's on, on the white paper. Um, check out the code, join the group, and uh, thanks for listening. Thank you.